and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Tom Phelan. Tom, thank you so much for being with me today. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. So Tom, I want to jump right into our interview and I want to talk about investing and your take on investing. And I want to preface my question by talking about the fact that conventional wisdom tells us that we need to max out our tax advantaged vehicles like 401ks and IRAs, but you have a very different opinion about that. Why is that conventional wisdom wrong? And why are tens of millions of people, and last I checked, it was about 43% of the workforce. Why are they gambling their money away in, in 401ks and IRAs? Well, Mark, first I would say, oh, thanks for being on your show. I hope I can impart some knowledge of some of my experiences. First of all, I would say the major reason is people just don't know. An alternative has not been brought to them. And secondly, I think tax uh, advantages and the gambling aspect of investing in a 401k through Wall Street products is or an IRA with Wall Street products should be separated because they really are two different animals. Now, traditionally, when you talk about tax advantage, the financial advisor Wall Street has had a mantra for many decades that don't pay taxes now when maybe you're in a higher income tax bracket. Pay when you retire. It'll be lower. I wonder how many of the 45 million IRA holders or 30 million 401k holders have ever stopped, taken a deep breath and said, I wonder how true that is. Uh, how much lower? Or how could I predict it? Well, number one, you can't predict it. But if you were to look backwards 100 years, you would find historic federal income tax rate has been 55%. A lot of people don't realize it was 90% right after World War II. It was 50% wow. under Reagan. He brought it down, but it was still 50%. So with Trump's cut, it hasn't been lower in a long time. One of the component is the national debt. When Clinton took office, he ran up in a positive sense about a $300 billion surplus. When Bush Jr. took over, he had a $300 billion surplus. Now, I'm not here to applaud Bush or, or Clinton or disparage either one of them. I'm just saying that's a financial fact. Under Trump, and he had some trying times and some things that maybe he couldn't control. But during his run, the national debt now is above $25 trillion. So I look at you and say, Mark, if you've got another 10, 15, 20, 30 years to work, can you honestly say that when you retire, taxes are going to be lower? I don't think so. So why are you buying into this? Why are you so excited about putting pre-tax? On paper, it looks pretty. Mark, you put 1000 a month off your salary into a, an IRA or 401k, company 401k. And you see it come right off your gross. I got to admit, that's exciting. It's not uh, within the clutches of IRS's tax uh, grab. Sure. However, what are you going to pay later on? If you take Jim and Joe, twin brothers, and they both start a job at age 25, and they retire at age 65, and Joe has a traditional IRA, and his brother has a Roth IRA, mm -hmm. and then the brother with the traditional IRA pays up tax based on a very modest tax rate, they're both going to have contributed to Uncle Sam the same amount. So you don't gain anything unless somehow tax were at 10%, 5%. It was uh, legislated illegal, <laughs> which we know is just not going to happen. So that's one uh, wing of the airplane. Why all of these people putting their hard-earned money away have just taken it as gospel truth that it will be cheaper in the future. Because how many people would put money into an IRA or a 401k if the employer or Uncle Sam says, I got gotcha. you. You are going to pay dearly for this when you retire. I think you probably would say, well, I'm not putting it in. I'll find something else. Now, the second thing, Wall Street, I won't say is deceiving, but it's very careful how it, it, it promotes it, is your 401k funds, traditional or Roth, uh, taxes aside, and your 401k company is you're tucked away in Wall Street products. It's pretty well guaranteed. It's going to be there. There's no guarantees. The only guarantee you'll ever find is that your financial advisor is going to get paid. He gets paid whether your fund is up, flat, 
are down. And one of the most painful thing in the world is say you had $100,000 invested into the year, it's worth 95, it dropped 5%. And there he is with his one to 3%. It's tragic. But anyway, that's my take on people being steered incorrectly and should think of other assets. What are the myths and misconceptions of 401ks and IRAs? I think a myth is that they're guaranteed, but it, it is that somehow what's inside of it is guaranteed. About the only thing in an IRA that would be guaranteed would be a bank CD, a money market account. Gold wouldn't be. You can have gold inside of an IRA. You can't have antiques or collectibles like rare coins or whatever. You can't have them. But you can have gold. You can have gold stock. But it's not guaranteed. It can go up. It can stay flat. It can go down. You can have a lot of products in an IRA or company 401k, but they are not guaranteed. That's a myth. Number two, I think a huge myth of an IRA and a 401k company is that you have to buy a Wall Street product. No, you can buy, you ready? Real estate. Your IRA could buy a little single family home as a rental. You can't park your residence in an IRA or an individual 401k, but you certainly can put in a rental income. And that rental income could later be sold and may perhaps go into a duplex. Mm-hmm. And maybe five, eight years later, be sold and go into a fourplex. And so, Mark, when you're 65, maybe you have a nice size uh, chunk of your investment in real estate. And you also have stocks, bonds, gold, crypto coins. You, you could do whatever you want. Another huge myth is that your IRA, once you your eyes are open, that you can have real estate. You can invest in foreign real estate. Hmm. And let's say you and your wife gone to Mexico five times out of the last seven years, and you love it. And there's this development, beachfront lots, and you're saying, honey, $100,000, it's a half acre beachfront. You go back home and it's just a dream and you may visit again. You could use your IRA to buy that beachfront lot. And then when you retire in 20 years, guess what? It's probably worth a half a million. There aren't any more. You could buy an apartment in London as a rental. Paris, Syria, depending on your budget and how aggressive you are. (laughs) But the point is you can do it. Why would your financial advisor tell you this, Mark? Why would he say, look, let's move that 100000 that I'm making 3000 a year on and have you get a beachfront a lot in Mexico and I don't get squat? I, I can't say I blame that financial advisor. I probably wouldn't tell you either. And be prepared if you say to your financial advisor, you know, I think I'm going to move some of my uh, 401k, my IRA into real estate for laughter, for incredulous look. You're crazy. You can't do that. When I got into this many years ago, I actually had financial advisors say, you're lying, you're wrong, whatever, until I started backing up with court cases and what have you, that you could do it. Now, I want to split hairs here. Often, I'll talk about a 401k. I'll usually try to say company, meaning it's at work. It has a charter. It has an administrator, a plan administrator. And company 401ks are typically... The employer has said to a company, you take all the headaches of payroll and deductions and statements and whatever, and I'll funnel my 2,000 employees or my 20,000 employees to you. And guess who's there? Wall Street firms. They love it. Well, by charter, you can't say, go to your plan administrator, you want to hear laughter, and say, oh, I found this beachfront lot. I have 300 grand in my company 401k, I want to move 100 over, they'll laugh you out of the room. Or tell you it's the boogeyman, it's illegal. So when I say a 401k, I'm talking about an individual 401k. You can do two things. You can either take the tax hit, and I understand that's tough uh, to see on paper, and move it into a 401k individual, and now you can buy real estate or buy other things. Or you can wait till you're terminated, retire, quit, and move it into an individual 401k. As it stands as a company 401k, you can't do it. You cannot buy real estate. You're stuck to a menu. Guess who designed the menu? Wall Street. They say, Mark, you have choice. You have diversification. Here's 28 mutual funds to select from. That's Wall Street's concept of diversification. Mm-hmm. So I think those are the, uh, the two major myths. So where did these investment vehicles come from? 
Interestingly enough, and this will take a minute, but it's the heart, it's the core, it's the history, it's the genesis of the IRA is you're young enough, maybe I'd have to go to your grandparents to say that they worked a nine to five or an eight to five or seven to six long days for Sears or maybe General Motors or maybe Harvard, John Deere, whatever. And when they went to work, this is pre-1974, you would sit down with personnel, a human resource person, Mark, if you continue with us, let's say you stay with us for 30 years and based on our current pay structure, Mark, you will retire, I'm just going to use a figure, at $1,000 a month guaranteed for the rest of your life a pension, a defined benefit program. Most youngsters don't have a clue what they are. So you seriously rest assured right. that you will be covered. Some of them even offered if you passed away, your widow might get it and so on. When Congress in its wisdom came out in 1974 with a RISA Employees Retirement Income Security Act, Gerald Ford signed it in law. They, uh, part of it, an offspring was the IRA, Individual Retirement Arrangement. Most people call it Individual Retirement Account. Back then, as I recall, it was about $1,000 you could defer taxes on. And believe it or not, most hard working Americans didn't have a grand to put into it. They did it monthly. So they would use a bank book or set up an IRA and put 80 bucks a month into it. Into the year, they have $1,000. This didn't raise the interest of any particular industry. The banking industry wasn't getting rich on it. And no one else was. And we'll get into who those people are. And so it chugged along. I think, well, I think it went to 1,200, then 14. But suddenly, slowly, someone an in industry, Wall Street, said, if we have one mark putting 100, 100 and a half a month into an IRA and we buy Wall Street products, yeah, not a big deal. We have 100 marks, we have 1,000 marks, we have 10,000, we have 100,000 marks, and we have a packaged product, financial product, like a mutual fund. You just simply buy, no big deal. It's the, the touching of a computer key, done, buy, sell, whatever. Mm -hmm. Huh, there could be something to that. Well, today, and I'll say it again, in IRAs, 45 million IRAs in America, there's $11 trillion with a T trillion. How would you like to be earning one to three percent fees on that? Mm. Staggering. And it is. Wall Street dominates 95 percent of those 11 trillion dollars. They have created a cash cow like you would never believe. Let's move forward. 1978, Senator Roth came up with the concept. What if we allowed taxpayers, not in a traditional, where they defer taxes, which is exciting on paper, pay the tax now, Mark, and uh, that's okay, because when you retire, all of that money you contributed and paid, paid tax on is tax-free. In theory, you have a, a lot of money, boy, and especially if it were in mutual funds or stocks that could double, triple, quadruple, all that money feeding you back, it's tax-free. I'd like to think Senator Rock did it for altruistic reasons, but let me ask you a question. If I suddenly switched billions going into traditional IRAs, no taxes yet, IRS had to wait into Roth IRAs where IRS was getting its due now. Would that be attractive to Congress? I think so. Yeah. And, and Roth still, I don't know the statistics. I haven't looked lately, but a Roth IRA still trails pretty far behind a traditional IRA. Most people are still doing traditional. And they certainly don't want to take fifty, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars and take the tax hit and go into a Roth. I don't suggest they do that, but they might check with a CPA and say, but what if I didn't take a hundred and move it over, maybe have tax creep? where I suddenly jump into a higher tax bracket. What if I did 33,000 three years in a row? That might make sense. And in three years, the pain's not quite as bad and you've moved it all over into, it'll be non-taxable in the future. And let me tell you, Congress is gonna rue that day if a lot of people start doing that because they have no cookie jar in the future. It's empty. They're spending it now. The 401k also evolved out of ERISA. And the 401k, as we know it, was some, I say fat cats, rich executives at Eastman Kodak, who convinced some congressmen, women friends, 
to enact something to allow them to park money into a 401k company, and it would be tax deferred. And what they would do is buy stock with it, their own company, maybe speculative stock, whatever. And their theory was, I can afford to lose this, but if I make money, I don't pay till I retire and my big salary and my bonuses don't apply anymore. I'm in a much lower tax bracket. That makes sense to me. So they got it enacted and it was really for the wealthy. It didn't help the working stiff. Hmm. Well, lo and behold, two years later, about 1980, a gentleman named Ted Bina, B-E-E-N-A, fascinating. He was a retirement consultant, specialist, many degrees, licenses. And he got through Congress, the 401k as we know it, for the working stiff, where he or she could put aside money. Matching funds and things like that all came about later. And so the average person at work could start taking the money pre-tax, which again, looks incredibly appetizing until the bill comes later. Now, a lot of people don't know, in 2018, Congress debated, didn't pass, didn't bring up for a vote, but debated heavily on should we lower company 401k contributions, currently at 18,000 a year, they want to cut it to 12,000. Now, you might think, oh, okay, so... Well, Mark, if you're putting 18000 a year where faithfully and not paying a dime on it, and suddenly you're cut to 12000 that's 6000 you're standing naked to the wind. Right. And it's taxable. Let's be right. 25%. Well, that's still $1,500 they pick up times tens of millions of contributors. Mm-hmm. We're doing it for taxation. Right. So will they pinch it in the future? I don't know, but I certainly wouldn't sit back confidently and not think they would. I am not saying that Congress will change laws that renege on what they've promised, tax-free with a Roth, but can they change the contributions or things over the years? Absolutely. And so to me, those are some of the biggest myths that exist. Again, it goes back to taxation and what you can invest in and what you can do with it. And I'd like to add one other category. We won't spend time on this, but I recently got very intrigued with 403Bs, 457s. They're -hmm. primarily municipal uh, school district retirement programs, and they're like the 401k in many respects. But did you know a teacher 403B can only invest in two categories, annuities, insurance industry, and Mm -hmm. Wall Street products. Wall Street, you can't Mm. invest in real estate. Isn't that interesting? So what are investment vehicles available to high net worth individuals that may be unknown to the average person? I would say one right away, and we'll talk about this maybe in a later episode, is 1031 exchanging, where you defer taxes. And one of the biggest myths about 1031 exchanging is I hear it from realtors all the time. Yeah, you're putting it off, paying taxes on profits, moving an investment property into another investment property. But Uncle Sam, he'll get you eventually. you got to pay someday. No, you don't. All you have to do is meet one requirement. Die. Mark, I think you're going to meet that requirement. I think so. (laughs) You could have done 25, 1031 exchanges going from $100,000 to $10 million office building And when you die, your heirs inherit on a stepped-up basis. So voila, it's the only case I know of beating Uncle Sam. Would you pay taxes on income in the meantime, though? Yeah, it doesn't shield income tax. But a real estate rental income, you have a couple of things. Mm -hmm. If you're leveraging, you have mortgage, you're right off. Mm -hmm. And unlike your residents, you have depreciation. So it's pretty favorable. Maybe sometime we'll go into that and maybe we'll use a few illustrations of 1031 exchanging, but those are pretty powerful. Now, in an IRA, if it owns real estate, of course the income is taxable unless it's a Roth and you cannot depreciate in an IRA Mm -hmm. a rental income property. You lose that ability. Now, that can be Mm -hmm. play a pretty big part. Maybe not. And that all depends on depreciation, as you know, or do you have a huge office building where 10 million sitting on a postage stamp size lot 
which is only worth 1 million, so you can depreciate the 90%, or do you have a thousand acres with a little ranch home on it where the land is not depreciable, comprises 90%, and what's depreciable is only 10%. The second one you asked that I'm well acquainted with, and so obvious, and it actually is the way to eliminate future tasks and risk double whammy is LERP. LERP is the Life Insurance Retirement Program. And LERP, if structured properly, allows you to take a whole life policy, use the cash value increases every year to buy options, say the S&P 500. You don't buy the options, and there's a reason for that. Your insurance company, by contract with you, buys the options with your cash value. Very important. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the year, they take a look. Is the S&P up? Like this last closing. Oh, yeah. Well, you exercise mm -hmm. your options. Right. Is it flat? You don't. Is it down? You don't. So if you had S&P was down 30 points at the end of the year, Mark, you wouldn't exercise the option. Now, you're out the option money, but voila, you have no losses. I have a chart, red line, blue line, which shows one that uses LERP and one that doesn't. And it performs about two times better than the one that is not buying options through the insurance company. Now, the reason an insurance company buys the option for you, by the way, you can go out and do this yourself mm -hmm. uh, without using LERP, but it doesn't have the same benefits. If you use LERP, it is considered, can be considered tax-free money. Obviously, if you die, okay, the insurance face amount is paid. And if you take it out of retirement, it's tax-free. Huge. That is huge. Tell me, the wealthy don't do this. They do. They have huge insurance policies. I often hear, well, rich don't need it. They have it. Rich have annuities. They have all kinds of things because they want to be well protected, well covered. And then another thing that the wealthy know about is something called living benefits. Living benefits is the single biggest beneficial change for you, the insured, the policyholder in 150 years in the wow. industry. And what it basically does is it will pay up to 90% of the face amount of the policy if, while you're living, obviously, you suffer a critical chronic or terminal illness. Mark, God forbid you're diagnosed with term to stage three. It could get bad. The doctor's not at all happy. You have a half million dollar policy. With your traditional policy, your insurance agent's going to visit you in the hospital, give you a get well card. Hope you pull through it, buddy. And right. in six months, if you hang in there, you have waiver premium. We'll make your premium payments. Oh, hurrah. I'm not saying that's bad, but as opposed to living benefits, he hands you a check for 90% of the face amount of the policy. You don't have to pay it back. It's tax-free, and you can spend it any way you like. It does not have to be spent on like medical expenses. Now, do you still have your insurance? Of course not. How could they pay you 90% and still cover you? But I've seen cases, terminal, they have a year, maybe less, and they do a bucket list, frankly. They cash in the policy under living benefits, and they go see parts of the world where they can, still can. And they uh, maybe had the daughter gets married, have a fabulous wedding. They fulfill some of the things in their bucket list and then pass on. And a lot better than you're struggling. Because think about it. If you're really laid up medically, you're in that hospital bed, and God forbid, you can't afford your mortgage and now your life insurance premiums are falling behind. That's not good. And I will say with LERP too, Mark, you put 500 a month into an IRA, into a company 401k, and uh, God forbid you die a year from now, what's your wife get? $6,000. 12 contributions times 500 bucks. If you had a LERP, maybe the face amount of the policy is a half million. She gets a half million to do what you two would have done for her. So that's another tool that the wealthy use that stunningly, I would say 90% of financial advisors couldn't begin to define or tell you what a LERP is. They couldn't define or tell you what a living benefits policy is. 
because you don't need LERC for living benefits. Your policy would have it. You'd be crazy not to have it. Oh, one other thing. Did you know that LERC was free? Those extra provisions, they don't cost you anything. Wow. So I guarantee you, your life insurance agent, and I will get a little tough here. They mm -hmm. either don't know or they know and they're not telling you because their company doesn't offer it. It's only about 5% of the hundreds of millions of policies in America, life insurance policies, have living benefits. And I guarantee you, your Wall Street financial advisor, your insurance agent, don't know a thing about 1031 exchanging. So three, I think, of the greatest tools in your retirement toolbox are laying there dusty at the bottom. No one's bringing them to daylight and showing them to you. And, and that's my crusade. I want to go back and just to dovetail on 401ks and IRAs, why do you think people default to those vehicles? It's the only thing they know. When they can save discretionary, otherwise maybe they have a pattern, get a new job, get a raise, and you and the wife sit down and say, honey, we can put 250 of that away. Maybe you have a car payment end. Honey, we got 250 that we could actually put in savings. And then you hear Susie Orman or David Ramsey or someone extol the virtue of having them that and you say, well, wait a minute. If I put that 250 into a traditional IRA, traditional 401k, gosh, I don't pay any tax on it. So I'm basically gaining on this. And it's a very attractive sell. And, and that, I would say that is why. Now, 401k companies are a little different. Typically, if you're at a company, you just started 30 days, 90 days later, they sit down for a review. And Mark, happy to announce that you now qualify for our group insurance, which is terrific. And uh, maybe the company picnic and also retirement. And I had this tremendous plan. It's with Fidelity or Trifus. Yeah. And uh, we administer it for you. All you got to do is tell me, what you want taken out a month. And bingo, it's easy. Candidly, Mark, you can be an investment warrior who sits on the couch and does very little. You literally relegate, abdicate it to someone else to worry about your future. And uh, God love plan administrators, but most of them aren't financial advisors. They're plan administrators on those no squad. And guess what? If you went to them and said, I really thinking about a gold index fund or maybe a gold stock versus the actual metal, what do you think? You know what they're going to say? We can't provide you investment information. We're prohibited. And so there goes any real value there. The employer, you can see why the employer likes this because the employer doesn't have to do any of the paperwork. And I, I missed a huge facet of this. And the employer doesn't have to contribute a dime towards you. In the old days with your grandparents, they did every month. And you hear about it today. In fact, it went through Congress, I believe, with the last stimulus bill of catching up our funding underfunded retirement programs. You had huge yeah. corporations that didn't put in billions, waited for a better year. Congress let them slide by not passing more draconian punishment. And now suddenly, I don't know how much it is, but it's tens of billions. 86 billion. We are paying because Sally or Sam's company didn't fund it. Going back to your grandparents, when they did fund it, picture this, Mark. Your grandparents worked at a company that had 5,000 employees. So they have a fair amount of money accumulating. Do you think your, the company they worked for invested it directly? Some might have invested some of it but they were held responsible to pay when he retired or pay your grandparents. So what did the companies do? And this is so important. They passed the buck and the treasure chest of accumulated pension funds to who? Not to Wall Street, to insurance companies. Hmm. And the insurance companies annuitized it. And that's how your grandparents had a guaranteed lifetime for a given amount income. All neatly tucked away. It's how it should be in a sense. I'm, I'm not a big annuity fan, but I sure am a fan that it will be there. Even the wealthy do that. Believe me, they buy a million dollar annuity. They chuck it away like a piece on Monopoly and they forget about it. But anyway, th th that's a couple of things I think why people are automatically steered.
Why do you think people don't know about these other investment options or approaches? I don't want to say they're exotic, but they're not in an income bracket to where the worth of your financial advisor and CPA is they better know the darlings that have come down are going to be phased out. For example, you're making $10 million a year and you had a financial advisor or even you know someone wealth management for you. And let me tell you, they probably would have been presenting to you windmills, energy from windmills, incredible uh, rapid appreciation. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, companies, because they don't know any better or don't care, certainly the management, not the owners, CEOs, I guarantee you have wealth managers. Right. They're not going to have a presentation for the employees by someone to talk about LERP, to talk about 1031 exchanging, to talk about living benefits. They're going to talk about Dreyfus Fund, Fidelity. They're going to do the same old. And so you hear it enough, you believe it. And then I think by human nature, we are couch potatoes. (laughs) All of us have some element. (laughs) And it's so much easier to sit back. Yeah. I have a cutout of Wall Street, an article, this has got to be 15 years ago, where the economy tanked, Wall Street included. And someone wrote in, and this was a column in Wall Street, oh, on my statement, I get sick. I want to kill myself when I open my statements. Hmm. Oh, they've plunged, they've plummeted. It's terrible, terrifying. And Wall Street's advice was, don't open them. Don't open them. <laughs> it's good print. Put this statement in a drawer, close it, and someday when you open it, there'll be some good ones in there. I can't totally deny that unless you bought, what was it, Enron or something? You're toast. It went bankrupt. You're gone. But you have uh, pharmaceutical, probably like real estate in 20 or 30 years, it will have gone up. Mm -hmm. You'll have more than you put in. And, And I do agree with Wall Street. Stay the course, hang in for the long haul. However, don't close the door on LERP or 1031 exchanging as a means, mm-hmm. real estate. Don't. Yeah. And you know what a lot of people do, you know as well as I do, is they start making money. This is very typical of a movie star or sports celebrity. And they get into breeding zebras in Bolivia or something like that. And it ends up being challenged by the IRS, disqualified, yeah. and they put a ton of money. I can't tell you the times. Woody Allen... And Elvis Presley put millions in that this bogus stuff, yeah. but they had an excess of income. You mentioned Dave Ramsey earlier, just a few minutes ago, and he's been a very effective uh, advocate for a lot of people and, and has helped a lot of people. What do you think of him, the kind of advice he gives and things like that? I think Susie Ormond's the same way. Mm-hmm. I can't say it's a bad thing. You have a child get married, 23 years old, let's say, got both have careers, and you sit down and maybe you talk to them. I know it's you guys, if you got three credit cards, you've got a max, let's pay those down now that you're starting your full-time jobs. Don't use them as much. Do you really need that Land Rover $900 payments? I'm, I'm serious. You have a heart-to-heart talk, okay? Sure. Ramsey and Orman are big advocates of that. Cash. I am a big advocate, have six months of reserves. So if you're nuts three grand a month, have 18, 20 grand put away minimum. However, when you get beyond that and they want to almost bring you to the gatekeeper of a 401k company or an IRA and not say your homework must include 1031 exchanging, understand it, real estate, rental real estate, investment real estate, mm-hmm. alert a policy with living benefits to protect yourself. Orman and Ramsey, I quote him in one of my books, both think whole life is for a fool. Only a, a fool would not, uh, a non-fool would buy term insurance, which he should. That's savvy. That's smart. Let me tell you something, and it's rare I'll bring it up, but I think it's absolutely appropriate. I have a large term policy. I bought into that, and yeah, I'll get whole life again someday. And I'm fairly large. I took it out 10 years ago. Seven years ago, I was diagnosed with stage two cancer. Hmm. And I had chemo. I had radiation. And thankfully, I'm seven years later and I'm healthy. Do you think at the end of the 10-year term, they're going to renew my insurance? Hmm. Well, the answer is yes, only because I had guarantee renewable. 
I've sold insurance, so I have a, maybe a, an upper hand to some people. I understand yeah. it. But guaranteeing convertible, what if I had converted that insurance the whole life? You bet. But I didn't read my policy. And the last three years, I had to convert it within the first seven. I didn't think about it until two or oh. three years from expiration saying, I better see what the premium is going to jump up to. It's too late. Yeah. So here I sit and I guarantee okay. you an awful lot of people, they're sitting in the same kind of position. And yeah. that's when you need it most. Ormond right. and, and Ramsey are just adamant that you're crazy to do it. To me, you're not if you use LERP. Mm -hmm. Have LERP cover you for that life insurance, living benefits on that policy, yeah. which is truly life insurance, not death insurance. And you're investing in Wall Street. Mark, how could it be any better? And I'll bet if they know about it, they would dismiss it. I truly believe that. Oh, I, I, there's no big deal about that. It's something fancy or a fad. Now, if you have a listener that can come up with a quote by Ramsey or Orman, honestly, I, I, I welcome it. I will stand corrected and I'll make sure it's in my books, but not from the research I've done. They don't promote it. They don't bring it up as uh, one of the avenues to do. I don't think Robert Kiyosaki does. No. Uh, I don't think oh, Tony Robbins does. Any of those gurus. And they're in some fancy things because they make bucks. Why do you think real estate investment and 1031 exchanges are a more effective approach to investing for retirement? Let's say that translates to a better yield, a better asset, uh, a more stable, a safer. We'll throw those all into the pot. Yes. I don't think it's more effective as much as it can be as effective, perhaps more, and should be one of the components of your diversified portfolio. That's my gripe, is it, it often is not. Do you know the majority of realtors don't own real estate, a rental income property? The majority. They don't understand 10 exchanges. exchanging. They go, why would I do that? I think rental real estate and exchanging is simply a way to accumulate wealth faster and more wealth and never pay taxes. Let's just talk about rental real estate. A, if you can do it, and you, I, I suggest you use leverage, but do it conservatively. You put 25% down, you get that single family home. Where do you get the 25%? You get it from your IRA, your 401k. You can borrow perhaps, or you just liquidate them and, and, and pay the piper. Now, you buy real estate, you have a couple of advantages. As I mentioned, you can depreciate the property. That offsets your income. From your income, you know you can uh, deduct expenses, taxes, sure. insurance, mortgage payment. So that $1,200 a month isn't necessarily $1,200. You might have 300 bucks left over by the time you pay those, okay? Especially with 25% down. Now you do depreciation. Maybe you're down to 100 and a half. Mark, you can handle tax on 1800 a year, I think. Now, Mark, you parked that 25000 in a CD at 2%. What would you have at the end of the one year? They make 25000 Laughable. If you put 25% down on a $100,000 single family home and it appreciated at 2%, what would you have at the end of the year? 2000 You are gaining appreciation on leverage. Maybe you could do that with gold or stock if you went into margins and whatever. It gets pretty technical, but right. you wouldn't have depreciation, would you? Right. You wouldn't have the availability of taxation. Now you go to sell your leveraged gold, your margin, you made a profit. You're looking at capital gains, shorter, long-term. Right. 1031 exchange that house because it went from 100 to 150. You don't pay any tax. Mm. It's really a no-brainer. Yeah. I cannot remove from you, Mark, your fear of the three T's, tenants, toilets, and taxes. But if the tenant trashes the place, well, Mark, there are people with personalities that would carry a baseball bat to go collect rent, yeah. and they will put up with the three T's. And there are properties that you would not be embarrassed to put your grandmother in. White picket mm -hmm. fence, beautiful little town home, single family home. And we're coming to one of my favorite stories, in real estate. And it's, we've talked about it. Now, I bet it's in your questions. But, but Tom, I live in San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York. Too expensive. I can't deny if you're making 100000 a year and your wife 100000 that you're going to be out looking at a $3 million property to rent. Probably not. Back in the 1860s, yeah. there were these hunters in Colorado that hunted buffalo, skinned them, and sold the hides. 
And every two weeks, the wives would come out in buckboards. It was a long journey, day's journey. And they'd have canned maybe fruit or vegetables or beef jerky or something to keep their spirits up. Because these guys wanted to accumulate a ton of hides to take in and make it profitable. Sure. And shoot during the season when the buffalo were grazing. The wives show up as scheduled. And the husbands are saying, we only got three yesterday. It ain't any more buffaloes. Well, finally ends up where they weren't getting any. And the wives are looking at them and getting tired of the guys griping, complaining. There's no buffalo. She says, you're in Colorado. I hear in Wyoming, the herds are in the thousands. Go to Wyoming. Go where the action is. Blackstone, huge funds. And that's a recent novelty, buying thousands of homes at a time. There are states, Mark, that a single family home isn't going to be like I'm here in Key West, 650. LA can be seven, eight hundred thousand, San Francisco maybe more, out of the ability to invest. There are states, yeah, it might be Oklahoma, might be Ohio, might be Georgia, that you can buy a home that is in good shape, got a solid rental history with 25% down and it's breaking even. But Mark, you'll have to hire a property manager. You don't have to, but you're nuts if you don't. So you give up 10% of the gross income and they handle the three T's. Yeah. And they hope to keep it rented. And it's all kinds of programs to make a tenant stay longer that are great incentives. And you might end up with a tenant for five years, seven years. I've seen them 18 years. They're still renting. You dream of those. You're not seeing tenants from hell, but you go where you have to. And mm-hmm. tell us it's time that maybe you have enough equity to come back to where you are. Or you may say, why do I want to buy a single family home for a million dollars when I can buy uh, a 10 unit in Tulsa? Nice brick building, clean, got good history. I can buy it and the cash flow is six grand a month as opposed to four grand. So bottom line, if you say no time, I live in LA and I'm not going to go anywhere else. It's got to be in LA. Then all I can say is, well, Mark, to put 25, 30% down, you're going to have to really pump up your IRA and your 401 or have a side savings account. And and maybe it's not for you. That's why a lot of people go for REITs. And I I think you'd mentioned that at one time, REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust. Mm -hmm. You know why stockbrokers like REITs? They pay 10% commission. Ah, look at that. REITs are privately owned. The the income's passed through. You don't have double taxation. And it has to be 95% distributed to the shareholders. And in a REIT, the REITs may own prisons, private prisons. They may own apartment houses. They can specialize. They own nursing homes. But if you track REITs, that REIT is probably not going to do a whole lot more than an S&P index fund. 10, 20, 30 years, maybe a little more. With a REIT, you put your 100,000 in net, and guess what? With a REIT, you lose control in the sense that you don't tell them when to sell. You don't tell them don't buy more and dilute it, and maybe they buy a couple of dogs. You're 100% responsible for the vicissitudes of life. Some people, maybe when you're older, REITs also became popular as a possible candidate for 1031 exchanging when Hmm. people were worried about the 45-day identification rule, and would they be precluded because they couldn't come up with a property? That's another episode. And something's come along called a DST, a Delaware Statutory Trust, which has really filled that bill. So your listeners who know a little about 1031 exchange and saying, oh, I don't want that sort of Damocles hanging over me. The 45-day rule is a real nifty tool to eliminate that fear. So would you favor real property over REITs then in terms of a return? Yeah. Yes. Unless it was granny and CDs made her nervous. Principal (laughs) bond scared her. I'm not going to try to force granny and say, granny, you should diversify. And sometimes you run into reckless to extremely aggressive. I have investors that get into deals with no money down and they might break even. And they're saying, hey, I'm getting two, 3% appreciation and I have no money in the game. That's the aggressive side. And then granny's the conservative side. But yes, I would. I would definitely, certainly plot the two of them. Let's say uh, single family homes, your first purchase or reach your first purchase. And where are you 10, 20, and 30 years later? 
and then compare the two. And the beauty again is if you cash in on a rate mark to enjoy the income, you're depleting first the income each year. And if you need, say, a thousand a month, 12 grand, and the REIT does eight, and you need 12, now you're going to start eating into the principal. With a house, it appreciates every year. What else appreciates? Rent. Right. Sure, you can have a vacancy, but let's talk about 30 years. That rent's going to be sky high. And so you're making more money, and you're never, ever depleting the house. And here's a bonus for real estate versus a REIT, gold, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. You can't live in them. I'm sorry, a single family home, you can uh, not renew a lease and move into the house yourself if it came to that. And that's something you cannot do with Wall Street. Can you give us a quick side-by-side pros and cons of real estate investment? Excellent question. And I go over this with every time I sit down with someone. A pro of real estate is the building appreciates. If you pay it all cash, that's the same as a bank CD, 3%, 3%. But if you leveraged it, use a mortgage, you're using mortgage appreciation or actually leverage. Real estate's not liquid. Mm. A REIT's not necessarily liquid either. You look at the, what it can be sold for each day, and yeah, you could execute a sale, but you might have a loss. You might be in a loss situation. And definitely an S&P or something else is more liquid than real estate without a doubt, but not as liquid as a a money market account or a CD. So the con it's illiquid. The pro is that you can buy and leverage property and gain on an appreciation. B, and I'm talking about investment real estate, you can depreciate. Now, few investments can you appreciate. You might oil and gas. You might be passed through some depreciation because of the sweetheart deals oil has for gas wells, gold. You can't say I'm depreciating my gold. But with real estate, investment real estate, if you had a mortgage, you could write off the mortgage against the income. So those are the major ones. Also, real estate is transmutable. You can change like kind. A lot of people misinterpret what like kind means in a 1031. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you have to do a two bedroom, one bath, single family home and do another two bedroom, one bath. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of 1031 exchange I handled. It was in Colorado. It was an elderly couple. They owned a huge ranch. Now, this people <laughs> sitting on a 2,000 acre ranch. Yeah, wow. Also, the husband and the wife, I can't remember which one, grandparents homesteaded it. And over the years, they sold 500, they sold 1,000. Yeah. They were down to 2,000 acres. And they were getting elderly. And he actually said to me, his concern was, believe it or not, he wanted to move and get another ranch, I believe it was in Nebraska, because of water rights. They were much easier to get in Nebraska and much more difficult in Colorado. So they were going to sell it. And even though it was raw land, their little farmhouse sat in a little corner acre tucked away, it was still valued. Oh, I want to say two and a half million, as I recall. And their basis was when they inherited it. So it wasn't what their grandparents got it for and homesteaded it, zero. Yeah, they had been on it for, they were in their 70s. Yeah. So it was probably two and a half million. They had a $2 million mm-hmm. capital gains. So that was 400000 in taxes. No, they just didn't want to do that. Right. What can we do? They had a son who was a struggling lawyer, but he was making it. And oh, they wish he could have his own office. And they had a daughter mm-hmm. who did hair. She didn't really like doing hair, but uh, she was good at it. She made money. But, oh, she would really like to do it for special clients and own the hair salon. And then they wanted some money, of course, to go to Nebraska and buy. I said, what if we did this? What if we sold your property and then you identified a hair salon business and purchased it and rented it to your daughter for fair market value? And she knew she would inherit it. And then you got a condo office type arrangement for the son as a lawyer. So now he owned his own and he paid fair market value rent. They have to, otherwise it's not, it won't fly. Now, if your son can't pay that rent, he's really difficult. Then you can gift him every year the money. He deposits it. And then he writes you his check. It's got to be his check or her check. And if we do that, let's say this is 300 grand for his office and it's 500,000. She buys a six station hair salon in a nice area. You still have a million and a half to go out and buy that ranch. She says, well, that's more than enough. What a solution. 
Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, life changing. Yeah. I think. Absolutely. To avoid 400 K and taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. so. And what a way to help that daughter's son get a head start. That's a trick the wealthy do, by the way, too. And as we know, a lot of children mm -hmm. squander the money. But the point simply being is they have the opportunity. You know, Dad, I want a Ferrari dealership. If you're right. Warren Buffett old school, well, here's a picture of one. May I tell one more quick story? Absolutely. 1031 exchange. This is for realtors out there. And it could apply to someone who's never been approached by a realtor. I had a realtor in Colorado, and he was a retired Marine, and in his late 40s, and second career, real estate. And he said, Tom, I came across this client. He's a dentist. God, he's got a great business. His son's graduating from dental school, going to be ushered into the business two, three years, take over, dad steps back. He yeah. owns his house outright. He owns five rental properties outright. Oh my gosh. And I want to sell him a sixth rental. I said, well, why not? I, I understand. He says, if I can get an appointment, he's a little bit arrogant, but if I can get an appointment with him, will you come with me? I said, sure. Hmm. He did. I met the dentist. He was arrogant. But anyway, I sat and talked to the dentist and his wife. And I did an analysis because I have software to do it on every rental and he wasn't making what he thought. Uh, often they don't take the equity, they take what they paid for it. And so he's thinking he's getting nine, he's getting four. Mm -hmm. So when that was a little bit of a blast of reality, but still, I said, doctor, I got to compliment you. It's where I sit down with someone who financially is so sound, diversified, you got a little bit of stock or bonds, this or that, you got your practice, cash flow, you got your properties, you own your home. I said, there's just, everything's there except one thing. And this kind of is gnawing at me. And he goes, well, what's that? I said, well, you're going to make the same mistake for your son that you made. And he, what do you mean a mistake? I said, doctor, you rent your office building. Yeah. And he sat back and said, yeah. And I yeah. said, you could own your building. Pass it on to your son. He says, you know something? Wow. Twice in my 30 years there, it was listed. And the realtor came to me, being a smart realtor, go to the tenants and sit, and I didn't have time to sit down and look at the books and crunch the numbers. Mm -hmm. I said, doctor, you're at a fork in the road. Let's take Monopoly, your Marvin Gardens, your Baltic Avenue, your Mediterranean, and let's exchange those into a park place or a boardwalk. Mm -hmm. Let's exchange your five rentals into an office building. And when your son takes over, he pays fair market rent, that's out of the cash flow, but by will or however you want to do it, you're leaving them the business. And he looked at that realtor and said, he's absolutely right. Let's list all five tonight. That realtor fell off the chair. <laughs> five listing. Get with it. That's why I love real estate. Before this interview, I went out to social media and asked folks for questions. And we got several questions, many of which you've already answered, but I want to just ask a couple, which I don't know that we've really, I think we've dealt with in, okay. in some form or fashion, but we one of them, we definitely haven't. So this question is from someone in our audience, where and how should we invest our money for the best return? Well, again, in my opinion, if a financial advisor, a lawyer, me, uh, insurance agent gave a pat answer, funds, goal, whatever, I think it would be patently not complete not a really fair answer best depends where you're at do you have six month reserves do you have life insurance do you have some things squared away and how much are you talking about i get it all the time tom i have thirty three hundred dollars in my ira mm -hmm. well that's different than i just talked to a woman a teacher a 403b she has eight hundred thousand so what is best for what kind of money if Someone is talking about diversification and they still have 15, 20, 25, 30 years of working years to go. I would absolutely say best to me would include real estate. I might even buy a little bit of precious metals, gold. Not a lot. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if I were doing real well, the one with 800,000, I don't know, maybe I'd buy a crypto coin. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that's a fair amount of money. Then I might look at Wall Street for something. I definitely would look at LERP, where you could put a chunk of that money, or if you're contributing, say, 1500 a month, and there are teachers doing that, and people at corporate jobs putting 1500 a month away, I might say, what would LERP do for me 
if I put a thousand a month into it? Number one, would I solve my life insurance problem for the rest of my life? I got a million dollars. It's it's good until I die or age 90 or something. You follow what I mean. And when I talk about uh, analyzing LERP, it looks at your IRA. It looks at your 401k and LERP and puts them side by side on an analysis chart. So it's not abstract thinking. It's factual. Once in a while, it might lose, but it's rare. That when it tends to lose its luster is when you get older, you're 65. It's awful hard to make up. So what's best depends on their age, their working years that are left, but best should, in, in my opinion, include diversification. Another question, and you just mentioned cryptocurrency just a moment ago, and one of our questions actually has to do with that. Mm -hmm. Would you invest in cryptocurrency and electric car stocks? And where would you put $1,000 or even $10,000 today? And this is coming from somebody who is retired, actually, from their career. A lot of crypto coin to me reminds me of trying to prop up a stock. It's like the tulip disaster in Holland. I don't mean it's going to crash, but right. a lot of it is it's the party favorite subject. It's mm. everyone knows someone who paid a hundred bucks or five hundred, or is a fool who could have spent a thousand. Now it's twelve or whatever. That trains down the tracks pretty far, to me. So mm -hmm. if you're saying to me, Tom, I just got a job. I'm making a million a year. What do you think? So maybe you want to buy five coins a year, 60 grand. Part of that might be for maneuverability to buy things without the government sticking its nose into it. But as you know, countries are trying to shut that down pronto, unless they're desperate, like Venezuela or some countries, Argentina, are actually looking at maybe in, in embracing doing cryptocurrency. So... To me, because of the price, I would say no. Even retired, unless this guy or gal is sitting on a huge war chest, guaranteed income, annuities, CDs, they have a couple of paid for rentals, cash pumps every month, and they're putting money away. I'm old enough to have relatives and friends that this is the case. Every month they go, well, there goes another five grand in the bank account. They can't spend it because they have modest lives. They're not out spending all the money. If someone gets down to $1,000, that to me is really throwaway money. If, if that $1,000 mm -hmm. would do you better in case you lost your job, and you don't have six months reserves, don't fool with it. Tom, this has been just an absolutely illuminating, eye-opening, eye-popping conversation <laughs> about investments and about investments that people don't really know about absolutely need to bring you back for other discussions related to LERP and 1031 exchanges. So this will not be our last episode, sure. but, but sure. thank you so much. For, thank you so much for taking this time with me and my audience and really educating us on some of these other things that aren't really in the, the mainstream Correct. of investments. The way I look at it, it doesn't hurt to know. Absolutely. And I want to thank you, Mark, and your audience for listening probably way over your allotted time. And I'm asking them, please write in, email, support Mark, support me in the sense that let us know what you thought, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And maybe from that, what you'd like to hear more about, because someone may have a facet of 1031 exchanging or LERP or something else that you and I didn't cover in great detail. How could you? Mark's the, the captain of the ship, but he'll see if it, it seems to be applicable and we will answer those questions. I look forward to future meetings. Likewise, Tom. Thank you so much. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, click the subscribe button to get the latest content and check out these other great clips from the podcast.